Hello, hello. How's it going, Spencer? How what's happening Good. in the life of Spencer Fry? Uh, there's a lot happening, uh, not only with work but also in my personal life. So it's been a busy last few months. I'm very, very curious to hear about. <laughs> well, as much as you want to share, because you said sure, personal sure. life as well, and I don't want to get too too deep into that. Not more than you're yeah, comfortable. Yeah, I can. I'll give you the TLDR. But um, basically, yeah, yeah. my wife and I got married last year during COVID. Uh, but we had our wedding um, just a co- only a couple of weeks ago. So there was that. And then also we moved into an apartment in Brooklyn, New York. Um, also, we bought a house in Connecticut. <laughs> and finally, so that's all the personal side of things. So life's been crazy. Um, but on the work side, we've, we've got a really big feature release coming out next Tuesday. So in about five days. Um, yeah. probably biggest ever in, in the last few years of the company. So just a little bit busy. <laughs> I'm a little busy. I'm very curious to ask for some preview early access, but the sure, thing sure. is go on. Okay. Are we getting some exclusive access in here today? <laughs> some early well, preview? we did just, we did just announce it to our customers yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like we haven't told the world, but yeah, happy to, happy to share, but, uh, we've been working on a community feature, uh, within the product. So um, about four years ago, we launched memberships, uh, which was a really popular feature and has been a really popular feature uh, to allow people to sell um, all their products through subscription and uh, comes with a bunch of different bells and whistles. Um, But basically at the time we were only a five person team. So we didn't have uh, the resources to build it out in all the ways we wanted to. Uh, Now we're 28 people and we've had those resources finally. And so earlier this year, we began working on community, which is a brand new standalone feature that works with memberships and allows all of our creators to um, have their own communities that are private or public. And, um, you know, their members can interact, make posts, all that sort of thing. So really, really excited about that. And it's been a lot of work um, and four years in the making, but finally coming out on September 28th. So super excited about it. Just like any overnight success, it takes four years in the making and you started for the <laughs> when 2015, if I remember correctly. Um, yes. Te- well, I actually technically, um, 2014, yeah. um, but, but it, it was just out. me for the first, yeah, it came out, um, a year ish later, I always get the early dates wrong because it's been so long. Um, but for the first year it was just me working on it by myself. Um, then I hired a contractor who, uh, has since become our CTO and has been our longest full-time employee. Uh, we raised some money in those early days and yeah, it's been, been many years now, which is crazy. It's been a lot of long time. <laughs> I was very, very inspired, so to speak, of, of reading your, it, w- it was just a quick blurb from the AMA you've had on our community. Thank you again for coming. And it, just the, uh, just the short version inspired me. Then I went and looked a bit deeper yep. and um, obviously found some more inspiration there. So uh, yeah, I, I want to get into that. The, the, for the people listening, the reason, uh, one of the reasons we both know it, the main reason why we started this call was so we can discuss this, this uh, special situation of yours where I think you've got some very valuable insights, a bootstrapped yeah. founder turned funded, if, if that's a thing, funded founder. I haven't heard that before, but <laughs> here we are inventing words. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but, but also on the personal life aspect, because I feel like, people like when you're when you're bootstrapped it's people are very much understanding that you equals the company and the company doesn't equal just you but it's it's this duality thing so um mm-hmm. but anyway b- before that i so we started into this intro i usually like to take it uh to start it with the person life a tiny tiny bit just because sure. Um, I don't know if that's your case, but from other founders that I've spoken to, it is like a breath of fresh air. That's what I've heard from them. They said, look, the fact that we talked about a tiny bit about my personal life just got me more (laughs) excited because nobody cares about that. They just care about the company and the numbers. So is is it fine if I just start by asking you what's what's a day in the life of Spencer Fry like? What's your usual day like? Um, I mean, this is probably what every entrepreneur says, but no, no two days are the same. Um, I mean, every single day just changes and it changes multiple times throughout the day. So for example, like today I 
thought I knew what I was going to be dealing with today. And I thought I knew what my workday was going to be like, but you know, even within a few hours, everything changes. Um, but, uh, I think that's part of the interesting, um, part of being a founder is that, you know, your calendar changes all the time. You know, you have a meeting with someone that turns into another few hours of work that you didn't expect. And it's just, everything is crazy. So, um, but typically I, I, you know, like some of the boring details is I wake up, uh, I make coffee. I, you know, have some, something small to eat. I open up my, my computer, start going through all my email, like that kind of thing. I sort of like to knock that out. Um, first things, like kind of around seven in the morning. So I, I usually wake up pretty early. I usually get up around somewhere between six and six thirty. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I, and I haven't always done that. I think, um, I don't know, as you get older, I'm 37 years old now, you just naturally wake up earlier <laughs> and you go to bed and you go to bed earlier as well. Um, but yeah, then kind of just work throughout the day. I'll usually take some sort of break for lunch, but you know, it can be 11 in the morning. It can be one 30 in the afternoon. You know, it's really kind of sporadic in terms of timing. Um, I usually like to have lunch with my wife and I'll take my dog for like a, you know, 15, 30 minute walk. Um, and then just kind of continue on with the day. And so I typically end around somewhere between five 30 and six 30. Um, and then I do like a workout usually, um, Apple, I'm a huge Apple fitness fan. Hmm. Um, and then I'll usually like check my email and my computer again, some, you know, throughout the evening. Um, I'm, I'm connected too much probably, uh, but I enjoy it. So, you know, it's all good. <laughs> a couple of things yeah. there, multiple things I want to ask you about. First of sure. all, what's, what's your dog's name and what, what breed are they? Sure. Her name is Scully. Um, and she's a Tibetan terrier and she's named after Dana Scully from the X-Files. Uh, if you're familiar with that TV show, <laughs> no, no, but I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> you might be a little, you might be a little young. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. It was like a, a nineties, nineties hit. Yeah. yeah. It's really good though. It still holds up. It's, um, about extra terrestrial, uh, stuff and FBI agents and all that kind of fun thing. So, mm, oh, the X-Files. Yeah. So was yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was the the gentleman who played in another show called Aquarius as Sam Hodiak, and it was the the lady, right? The the main X Files mm -hmm. detective w w was that who we talked about? Yeah, so she, uh, Dana Scully, um, she's the character, and uh, our dog's named after her. <laughs> right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I think yeah. X Files had something like a, a bunch of seasons, if I'm not mistaken. Like it. it yeah. Tried, it, it took a long, long time. But yeah, um, I mean, I don't remember the exact number, but it was, I think, somewhere between eight to 12 seasons. Um, but they're all really good. Every episode is sort of a standalone episode um, where you don't really necessarily need to have watched all the other the previous, previous seasons. Um, I mean, obviously, there's an arc to the show and it, it is helpful, um, but it's one of those cool shows where you can just kind of jump in and watch an episode. And they're really fun, um, very much like 90s vibes. Um, which is, you know, popular right now. <laughs> I love that. And I also love that about, especially about books where, where you mm -hmm. can just, and the, the offer even incentivize you. They, they tell you, please do this. Just open up a book at a random chapter and start doing yeah. that because the, the, the randomness and the uh, flexibility of the book allows you to do that. And you still get something out of it. So uh, yeah, good thing to have on a TV show as well, I guess. Yeah. And I think modern, I mean, going off topic a little bit, but I think modern TV these days is they expect you to invest your entire life, um, into the series. And, you know, you can't just watch an episode here or there. You have to be like, okay, I'm going to dedicate the next 12 hours to this, this show or something like that. Um, which is good because you can, you know, get more, um, engrossed in it, but at the same time, it's, it's difficult to like commit to that, you know? <laughs> and, well, and yeah, it, it's all about the engagement, isn't it? And, uh, yeah. What, what was that quote that sleep is our competition or whatever that, that, that sort of thing that Spotify people said. Nef yeah. Or Netflix, I think. Or Netflix. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, well, something like that. Yeah. There you go. Netflix yeah. speaking about the devil. And, yeah. and you've also said you didn't used to wake up this early. Was it just the, the uh, randomness plus flexibility of being a business owner plus being bootstrapped in the early days that allowed you to, I mean, not that if you get, uh, if you raise money, you have to wake up at an early mm -hmm. hour, but, um, was it that sort of scenario before? No, I, I would typically, you know, I'm not, I'm not asleep until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock person. Like 
I think when I was younger, I would probably get up around nine or whatever, um, you know, head to the office, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's more just life changes. You know, I think at the time I was single now I'm, you know, married, I have a dog. Um, but I also, we have employees who are, um, in Europe too. So, you know, they're starting kind of five hours before me. Um, so, you know, maximizing my time overlap with them is really helpful. Um, we also have people on the West coast in the United States. So I'm, I'm basically like right in the middle <laughs> yeah. being on the East coast. Um, but also I think like, yeah, I mean, just as you get older, you go out less, um, or when you do go out, you go out earlier. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, it just kind of, there's like a cycle. It's funny because when I was younger, I was like, I'm never going to be that 37 mm-hmm. year old guy who goes to sleep at nine 30. Um, but yeah, I'm that guy now. And I guess when a world pandemic hits, you also don't go out that often. So that affects That's your, true. your yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do, do you do you believe in uh, having a routine or because what you said make made me assume I might be putting words mm-hmm. in your mouth here that when five or six p.m. hits you stop and then you said you also check email is that that might be like something like light work so what yeah. what was that like? I mean, so um, I don't I don't have like a fixed time. Like I just think on average it tends to be somewhere between five thirty and six thirty where I sort of. Mm my day just naturally ends. Um, typically like that's when all of our European people are definitely done. Most of our East coast people are pretty much done. So there's only kind of like our West coast people around. Um, so yeah. So in terms of routine, I don't have a really fixed schedule. Like I'm not saying I'm going to be at my desk at this time. I'm not going to leave my desk at that time. Um, I kind of like to sort of anchor my day where, you know, every morning I'm going to make coffee and have something to eat. I'm going to check my email. That's kind of like one anchor. Um, and then the, the anchor at the end of the day is just making sure like all my emails clear, all my notifications are clear, all my base camp notifications, like everything is just off my plate. Yeah. Um, and, and then I'll snooze anything that I don't feel like dealing with, uh, until the following day. So I just kind of like to start fresh and end with like a clean slate. Um, but other than that, I don't really have a, you know, specific routine. All right. What I've done indirectly so far in this episode is kind of like a web page where you uh, <laughs> want to filter for people. You want to weed out the ones that this page is not for. In the same way, whether I realize it or not, I uh, hope I lured people who are into this thing of bootstrapping and maybe um, uh, more about your early days and the people who might have been on the funded side or from that camp mm-hmm. not that you have to be from one camp or another uh, have closed this earlier because we have closed this episode playing because um i'm interested to know so uh, uh on on your ama i was asking you what would you recommend first going to into building what i called a platform of wealth or aiming straight for something um, ambitious, something like a moonshot, something maybe where the TAM is high, such as Podia or something where you have a bet and you might be early. And I think you were and probably still are early, even though it starts getting better and better right now for Podia. Um, th- that sort of thing. Do you understand what I mean by, by these two things where, where I mean a foundation of wealth versus a moonshot, which has higher risk, mm-hmm. but also higher reward. Yeah. So, so um, go on, go on. No, no, you please, 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 please. Uh, I, I was going to say, I also wanted to add into perspective the fact that this is uh, uh, coming from my position, being young and having a business that pays for my expenses. Uh, we're doing six figures. We made about $200,000 last year. So doing okay for living, but mm-hmm. clearly uh, there is space for something more ambitious. Yeah. But I, I was just looking I- into your story and it felt like you have a, a ton of insight for me, but also for people listening who might be making maybe 200K a year, or maybe they have a micro or maybe they first want to make a micro SaaS and then aim for something higher. Uh, I just feel like w- with your experience, you have mm-hmm. some shortcuts, so to speak, to, to give us, whether it's time or information. Yeah, I mean, happy to to speak to, you know, both sides of the coin there. I think, um, I mean, a lot of it just comes down to your own personal, um, 
ambitions. Uh, I, I kind of hate that word because it's like, oh, what you're saying? I don't have ambitions. <laughs> but I mean, there's there's many people that are extremely happy to be pulling in hundred thousand dollars a year with their their company or hundred fifty thousand or two hundred thousand or whatever. Um, I think really what you have to ask yourself, and I think it changes a lot when you're young versus when you get older. When you're young, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty thousand dollars, two hundred thousand a year, you're just like, oh my god, I can't imagine making more money than this. I'll never need more money than this, whatever. Um, I think as you get older, you start to think a little bit more about like, okay, now I need to plan for my retirement, make sure that if I'm, if I'm going to have kids, like I need to, you know, earn more money or something like that. And so I think some of your ambitions begin to increase a bit, um, you know, where you might've been happy bring in $200,000 a year with your startup. Now you understand that you might need to bring in more money. And obviously it depends on where you live um, and, you know, what kind of family you choose to have or not have. Um, but for me, I think as I was young, I was super content earning a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, you know, 22, 23, 24 with my startup. But then as I got older, I was like, okay, wait a second. Like, let me look at these expenses. <laughs> like I want to, I want to buy a house. You know, I want to have a foreign family. Um, I need to kind of adjust my risk tolerance and maybe take some like more risky bets with my company to try to earn more revenue. So I think it's a really personal question that people have to ask themselves. Um, and then you just kind of have to fit your startup in, or like drive your startup in the right direction, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, you are very constrained with certain businesses. If you, you know, start a micro SaaS, I, I personally don't like the idea of starting a company that has a very small purpose and that is like capped at a, at a small valuation, because it's just kind of a bummer. Like you get to that, you know, that, that place and you're just like, okay, cool. Like I can't really go beyond this. And then that's like, that's kind of, that sucks. Like now you have to start something new. And so I prefer to have to start every company I start to have a shot at being really, really big. And, you know, maybe I don't get there. Maybe I just get to like, you know, 2 million a year or a million a year or whatever, but at least I have the opportunity to get to like hundred million a year, 250 million a year or whatever. Um, so personally, like I like to look at large markets, um, always. That's very interesting. And I love the fact that we have different opinions. I'm going to, I'm not dying uh, holding my opinion, but I, 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 sure. I'm just uh, getting onto the micro SaaS, uh, attaching a bit to it because what I what, what looks what, what looks to me like attractive in micro SaaS is the fact that indeed, as you said, there's a cap to it, but there's also less. I don't know if there's anything with less risk out there in the world, but you might have higher chances to reach it, and off of it, maybe start the next thing. So I get your point yeah. of having that continuity because up to a certain point, both a Microsoft and a big TAM company are requiring about the same amounts of effort up to- See, a that, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the point that I'm trying to make is that mm -hmm. like, it's not really harder to build a startup in a big TAM market versus a Microsoft company. Like, you still have to put in the same number of hours. You still have to put in the same amount of dev time, design resources, support, you know, if anything, it might even be harder because you're, you're limiting yourself to a, you know, a tighter, smaller market. Um, you know, the pool of potential people that could use your product is smaller. You really have to, um, you know, be very selective and like what features you build and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, that's the thing, like maybe you could argue it's 10% easier to build a micro SaaS, maybe 20% easier, but you know, I don't want to play those, that, that those odds, you know, I'd rather, you know, take that 20% more risk, but for, you know, a 10,000% more upside. Mm -hmm. And what about this? Uh, now I, I, uh, I want to ask you to put on your, I'm part of a funded company mask, if that's okay. What about sure. Uh, these people who are diehard fans of bootstrapping and don't ever want to hear about raising funds from external sources, which are saying, yeah, but then there's going to be somebody breathing down my neck and then I won't have all that control. So I want to be on my own schedule. So that sort of thing. I, I'm not part of, I don't have, I don't share that belief, but I do understand the fact that if there are two completely different scenarios, if you are a broke student raising money from 
external sources and you don't really have a backup or scenario number two, you already have uh, maybe some hundreds of thousands or a couple million in the bank, or you have a source of income that you know, no matter what is going to cover your cost of living, at least for the next five years for you and your family. So these two separate things um, are com completely different when it comes to aiming for something higher. What about that point of view? So, um, you know, for, first for some context, I bootstrapped, I bootstrapped my first three companies. Um, I was very well known in the bootstrap community back in the day, you know? Um, so, so I, so I understand the bootstrap mentality. I think, you know, what I, what I tell people is, and especially like with this business too, I was planning to bootstrap this company. I wasn't planning to raise money. And for the first year I didn't raise money. I invested about $30,000 of my own capital. Um, but eventually, like if you are lucky and fortunate, um, you will build a product that investors are going to be interested in. And then at that point, you can have the choice that I had, which was like, should I accept this investment, um, which will de-risk my company in a lot of different ways, or do I not take the money and do I carry on, you know, one foot at a time with a small team? So I, I think it's no one should really argue one point or the other. It's, it's always going to be contextual for, you know, where your product is at, where your company is at, where your lifestyle is at, um, you know, whether or not you're going to even get an offer. You know, I, I think one thing that's funny to me is that a lot of bootstrappers say, uh, I would never take money. Well, you've never been offered money, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> like, come on. Um, you know, if I, if I say, I'm going to write you a million dollar check at a $10 million valuation and you have zero revenue, you'd be an idiot not to take it, right? Because a million dollars is going to give you a lot of opportunities. So um, until you're presented with that position, um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to take you seriously. Um, but at the same time, I think there's always misconceptions about taking money as well. Like if you take money from the right investors, um, you know, you will, you will be able to do whatever you want to do. And like, I haven't had, I took money originally about five years ago. I haven't had a single investor tell me what to do. I haven't had a single investor um, push on anything. Um, all my investors have been just been super helpful when I wanted it, them to be and not when I didn't want them to be. So, mm -hmm. and, and I think I, I said, I mentioned this on the AMA or I was on Justin Jackson's podcast and we were debating this too. Um, you know, just because you take money doesn't mean that there's going to, there's a list of negative things that are going to come down from it. Um, to be honest, mostly it's positive. And again, you have the choice to say no to that investor. If you don't like them, you have the choice to push back on the terms if you don't like those. And, you know, you can always walk away and you can continue to bootstrap. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's a tough question to give a bunch of insight on because it's really just mostly a personal choice for, yeah. for most people. Yeah. And, and I get a hundred percent what you were saying about, uh, well, you were never offered any money. I've also seen scenarios where people claim that then they build something which has leverage, as you were all pointed out, you get offers and then they say, well, you know, now it looks attractive. So I guess when people are diehard fans of I'm never going to take money, it's I'm never going to take money unless it's on some of my terms, at least if yeah. not on my terms. So I've also seen this. I was talking to Jason Cohen from WP Engine. He mm -hmm. started WP Engine completely bootstrapped. But then it turns out that as he was uh, clawing down this hole of hosting uh, WordPress websites, it turns out that this, this hole was getting bigger and bigger. And as you, as you were describing, starting from bootstrapped and then getting into venture backed, when you have the depth needed to go uh, to, to address it in this manner, is the way to go. So from what you're saying, yeah. it sounds to me like you're uh, innately you're already innately having it this way of let's start a bootstrap and only if there's enough depth, then you get venture backed as opposed yeah. to the usual. I mean, it's not usual anymore because it's 2021, but I guess in 2015, it was the usual story of you probably won't have anything besides the, the Silicon Valley show satire. You won't have anything besides the team you don't have any capital, you don't have any IP, any, anything, but you go straight for raising seed money based on the idea. And we know all the flaws that come with that model. They've been discussed. And yeah. discussed. 
but but also I would say like I think is you're wise to say that that was true in 2015, that was true in 2010, that was true in 2005, 2000, whatever. Um, but it's not true anymore. It's really really rare. I mean, the press will write about it, but it's typically you know it's someone who sold their previous company for a billion dollars or 500 million dollars, and maybe that person deserves a five million dollar check with right. nothing because they've proven themselves. And as long as they're, you know, building in a, in a, in a, an exciting market and, you know, with the, with the right team, like I'd probably invest too, because that's a person that built a billion dollar company, but people like you and me, or maybe even people who have never done anything. That's just not the case anymore. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of investors and, you know, you at least need some sort of product prototype, some sort of customers, you need something, um, you know, that's just. The, the old idea of like, oh, we're just going to write you a blank check because you know the right person. It's just, it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't investors who are still doing that. I'm sure there are. Um, but yeah, like you're not going to be taking money from them anyway, because you don't want to take money from investors who work that way. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we made that distinction, which I think is important for the discussion and for the people listening. I, I think, and I'd love to know if you agree or not, that there's also this distinction. There are companies which you can start by bootstrapping and then you find out whether the TAM is big enough, the total addressable market is big enough yeah. so that you can have this, you can put fuel on the fire. Yeah. And But there's also companies which can't really be started without raising funds or without you having a shitload of money, I guess. Yeah. But, um, then you need that leverage, as you said. You need to maybe have some. Ba- Uber is a classic example. It was 2009. Okay, different yeah. times. But Travis Kalanick beforehand sold a company for, I think it was 30 million or something. Um, but Uber can't really be started without funds. You maybe could make a proof of concept. But- yeah, and uh, they did. They did make a proof of concept. I remember. I think they had a fleet of you know two or three or four black cars. Yeah. You know, and, and like a crappy iPhone app on test flight or something like that. Um, you know, but I, I think also too, um, you know, I think you make a great point where it's just some companies need capital to get started. Um, and, you know, that's just the way the world works, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and thank, and thankfully they do because, you know, like we wouldn't have probably Tesla today if, um, you know, pre Elon, uh, you know, was owned by some founded by someone else, but I'm sure they raised a bunch of money to, you know, build cars, whatever. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of companies just need money to get started. Um, but I am a huge fan of starting bootstraps. I don't even like the word bootstrap. It's just like starting a company. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like yeah. the idea of like starting a company without revenue or sorry, without um, outside financing and just like plugging along and seeing how far you can get. And then I think at some point you're going to ask yourself the question, like, you know, what would a million dollars or half a million dollars or $2 million or $3 million get me? Um, you know, it's going to get you peace of mind as an entrepreneur. Cause you're gonna be able to pay yourself a salary. It's going to get you a team. So you can actually build a product that you have envisioned. Um, it's going to buy you some time, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of reasons why raising money is good. Um, but you know, the, the negative reasons are like, if you raise all that money and your product goes nowhere, you get no customers, then you shot yourself in the foot and you got to shut the thing down. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like maybe if you had bootstrapped it, you could have gotten yourself to $200,000 a year, $300,000 a year, um, and walk away with something. Um, so yeah, it's a gamble, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Much like any business or yeah. one could argue important decisions in life. Sooner or later, you have to take that risk. So uh, I-, I really love where this is going. We already have a bit of a decision tree uh, at, with at least two layers as far as I can tell. So starting bootstrap or one of the type of companies that can't be started bootstrap or self-funded at all. And then we have, are you going for... Anyway, anyway, I guess people can just rewind. So let, let me think. Uh, what I get out of what you're saying, which is very valuable, by the way, is if you ever want to... So if you make a micro SaaS, let me know if I'm getting this right, uh, you probably won't have the option to raise money unless you find yourself with a way deeper uh, well, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you do build a micro SaaS... 
in, there's often going to be like tangentially related, you know, uh, markets or like you can start there as like um, your beachhead into something bigger. Um, I, I just think like, you know, when, whenever you're thinking about building a product and you're building a startup, one of the first things I always do is just try to think about the market because, you know, you might be able to, the best product builder ever, but do you really want to waste quote unquote waste five years of your life yeah. building a product that caps out at like a hundred thousand dollars a year, $200,000 a year? Um, you know, you might have a thousand or 10,000 really happy paying customers paying you $3 a month. But like, I personally, that doesn't interest me. <laughs> it just, it's, it's, it's too much work for too little gain. Um, and I think like as an entrepreneur, most of us are driven by, we're doing this for a living. Like we're not doing this for charity, you know? Um, and so we're trying to earn a salary. We're trying to, you know, earn a living for our family. So yeah. So that's just not my, my, I also think one more thing on that topic. Well, um, I didn't realize I was going to get so heated about it. Um, but I think you're also doing yourself a disservice as an entrepreneur to target something so small, because I think that, you know, I think if you, if you are thinking about being an entrepreneur and you are a product builder, you should give yourself more credit and try to build something bigger, um, that has more impact. But anyway, I probably get some hate mail for that. <laughs> I mean, as you pointed out, it's about ambition, even though we're not attacking people for their ambition. It's about what you want in life and the sacrifices, whether you make them conscious, consciously or unconsciously, what you give and what you get. To your point of this isn't necessarily for charity or maybe not mainly, it doesn't start as mainly for charity. Salary aside, even maybe for uh, when it comes to the resources that you have at hand for the company, maybe a business cap that half a million a year, uh, won't have the luxury of hiring a, I don't know, video producer, let's just say, which you might have if you don't have that cap or if you're at 5 million, 10 million a year, that sort of luxury expense without which you yeah. could live, but it could help few. This is the sort of uh, sort of uh, luxury you buy yourself, I guess, when you aim for something higher. So revenues, because I guess Bootstrap is revenue self-funded revenue driven growth i mean yeah, yeah and, and i mean there's also plenty of bootstrap businesses and you know i know i know the founders of three or four that are doing like 20 30 40 million dollars in revenue a year um so i mean just i think that's another thing it's like you're not just because you're bootstrap doesn't necessarily mean you're capping your your um you know how much re revenue you can earn um but it's, it's going to be tough um also a lot of those companies that are have gotten that big were started over five years ago. Um, you know, you're not typically seeing um, in 2021, at least, and we're almost in 2022. You're not typically seeing new, brand new bootstrap companies in the last, you know, you know, since COVID start and grow big. And so I am worried about that from, you know, for the boot, my bootstrapper friends. Is it still possible to build a 150, 250, 500 million dollar company um, these days? bootstrapping. I worry about that. Um, I don't know if it's possible. I, I mean, obviously you can point to certain exceptions here and there. Um, but I think the like, you know, the base camps, the harvests, the convert kits, the, you know, these well-known bootstrap, the mail chimps. Um, I don't know if you can start a company like that anymore and get to the kind of those sorts of valuations. Well, I guess we'll find out in the next decade or so, or in the next decades. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, it's hard to know in you know a year after launch, but um, there's plenty of you know funded startups in the last year or two that are already billion dollar plus businesses earning hundred million dollar revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't personally know can think of any bootstrap businesses that have done the same. Right. So back to your point about uh, reading between the lines, what you say, what, what I understood from you is, look, if you will ever want to raise, or if you're ever considering raising and you're not shutting yourself down in your room saying, I will never take a uh, $1 million raise at a 10%, so $10 million on zero revenue, if you're not that sort of person, if you're ever considering raising money, you will need some sort of leverage, whether it's your personal brand, quote unquote, and I don't mean being Gary Vee, I mean your track record as a founder, uh, your product mm -hmm. or whatever, you're going to need some leverage and perhaps 
it, I'm adding this for myself, perhaps you even need some personal leverage when it comes to negotiating. Maybe if you're desperate on a personal finance level, you will take some, some of a lesser deal. Would you agree with that? Does that ever happen simply because the deal is at hand? Yeah. I mean, you definitely, I mean, you need leverage whenever you're talking with investors. <laughs> um, and I, I think the best leverage is just not to be able to walk away and say, I don't want this deal. Right. Um, and also not need it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely see companies that raise money on bad terms, typically not in their seed round, typically like their second or third round. Um, because, you know, if they don't take the money, they're going to have to shut the company down. Um, but yeah, I mean, as a bootstrapped company or just as a company starting out and not having raised any money, uh, I think the most important thing you can do is, is have a product that serves a purpose with uh, happy customers. And um, you could argue that revenue doesn't matter a lot in the seed stage when you're raising your first check. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and some people might argue that actually having revenue that early is probably a, a bad sign. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you definitely, definitely need leverage. I think another thing that people don't think about so much is that, um, how important the market is, um, and the market size, which we've talked about a bunch already on this podcast, but, um, if you are going to raise money, the market is so important. It might even be the most important thing. Um, you know, that you can just point to look at how big this market is, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah. So that analogy with surfing and what wave are you riding? How big can it get? Are you going yeah. with, the, with the, that sort of thing? Yeah. And, you know, um, like for us, for example, we're in the quote unquote creator economy, um, our, our company, and that is a huge wave that's only getting bigger uh, to use your analogy. Um, but if you were going to start a ride sharing company tomorrow, you might be screwed. <laughs> um, so you have to sort of think about that a lot. I mean, every entrepreneur needs to think about that when they're building their company, whether they're raising money or not. Um, but if you are raising money, it's just, you need to be in that, that market that is small or starting off, um, but has the potential to be really, really big. Um, so it's tricky and, and not to say like, we got a little lucky, um, you know, we started the company in 2014 and, you know, the creator economy was something that I was seeing, um, as starting at that time, but I didn't think it was going to be as big as it was, as it, it is today. And a lot of that is obviously thanks to COVID, um, driving more and more people to be creators. And obviously I couldn't have foreseen that either. So I would guess driving them faster because I think they were going to become anyway. And yeah, exactly. I mean, like, just look at Shopify's revenue it's crazy um, yeah you know, that was some acceleration just, as well yeah 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 and and we don't you know we're not in the same size as shopify or anything like that but you know we saw similar um growth in, in during covid too you mentioned earlier some uh when we were talking about bad deals you said uh it typically if it happens it happens around maybe not the seed right a seed fund maybe a bit first sorry second or third uh round you said and Obviously, they're an outlier, Atlassian, but I think Atlassian is a good example, if I'm not wrong with the facts here, and that's an if, that they've turned down some fundraisers and some in an acquisition at least. I was listening to the How I Build This podcast, and simply because they their product, that's what I'm trying to say, their product matured way later mm -hmm. or at a slower yeah. pace, but it as you can check the stock market today, I guess, they matured into something bigger than what those uh, fundraisers uh, or those acquisitions offered. So yeah. would you say that is a good example, even though I'm talking about an outlier, I don't know how often it happens because I guess you don't hear about them if they didn't <laughs> raise money and they die. That's some survivorship bias. Would you say that's a good example of having the leverage to stick to your guns if you have the conviction that it can grow into something big? Yeah, I mean, I'm not su super familiar with their product offering. I mean, I know it on the surface level or, or their company history, but um, I think what you're getting at is like how important being in the market for a long time is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, it's the most important thing. <laughs> um, you know, I, one of the things I always talk, tell other entrepreneurs is just how important perseverance is and persistence and sticking with it. Um, and I'm guessing that's sort of similar to Atlassian where, you know, they've been doing this, I don't know when the company was founded, but like 15, 20 years, something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe they're, they were, had some issues in the early days. Um, but yeah, they figured it all out. And, you know, we, we, we sort of are follow a similar, similar path where our product, and I think a lot of products that are, end up being really good, like Shopify, for example, it just takes a long time to get there because it's, there's so much product that you need to build. There's so much you need to understand about the market. The market's constantly changing. Um, you know, people have different, your customers have so, so many unique sets of demands. Um, so yeah, just being in the market a long time is, is very helpful. I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but you did. Yeah. You did. yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was just trying to get your opinion on this thing. And, uh, I was glad of what came out. So here's what I don't get. Uh, again, I don't have an opinion, but I'm trying to, uh, I think you internalize something in your head and that's when you might have an opinion and I'm trying to internalize it. I think you can internalize mm -hmm. something when you've explored at least a couple of branches of this tree. Otherwise, somebody just gives you a certain root on, on this tree, one branch, and you say, okay, that's what I believe. So what I don't understand is the fact that uh, you've mentioned this leverage, and I, I think anybody can agree, obviously, it helps to have some leverage when you're negotiating, when you're taking risks, when you're making life decisions, are we getting that house mm -hmm. or not, depending on who you're living with, how many people are in your family. What I don't understand is, can it be that a micro SaaS can be your leverage where all, all we're talking about, Spencer, I reckon, is managing mm -hmm. risk. And you could say that at, from a certain angle, business is that as well, if you can quantify it. So with the possible downside of taking it longer, because you take a two to four year detour, assuming mm -hmm. it works out in the first place, making a micro SaaS that can do 10 to 100K, can that be your leverage so that in parallel, because when you, I guess I need to define micro SaaS. Sure. When, when I'm thinking about micro SaaS for this applied purpose, I'm also thinking of something that has probably long lifetime value, sorry, long life customer cycles mm -hmm. and probably as low touch as possible, depends on the idea. And um, when I say low touch, I mean, it can run with less effort than it would take a company like, well, I don't have an example now in my head because I'm on the spot. <laughs> but um, I, was, I was thinking these days about this company that, oh yeah, Zipcar, those ride-sharing companies. Sure. They, they can't just let it go on autopilot as opposed to WordPress hosting, to mention again, Jason Cohen, because I mentioned him earlier. Um, that's, uh, that's what I'm giving as an example of a micro SaaS in your back pocket so that if you're going for a moonshot, whether the moonshot works out or not, you have this leverage, which can indirectly at least affect a, uh, a, an investor negotiation, such as the Atlassian situation where you might have the conviction that it might take five, it might take 20 years, you don't know, but this deal that you're getting right now, this investment isn't in your favor. And you just have to, what's that English saying? Weather the storm, you just need to, stick to your guns in the storm mm -hmm. to, to stick to your ship. So I'm just trying to put forward to, to see for your lens of, of a, of a seasoned entrepreneur, is this an option as well? And if it isn't because it, you disagree with it, why would that be? So, so um, just, just in summary, are you asking if starting a micro SaaS gives you leverage for fundraising in the future? Yes, I'm. I'm thinking. Is this a route as well? Making a micro uh -huh. SaaS yeah, that right, can make right. ten to hundred k uh, a yeah. month, and that's your your platform. So when I say platform, I'm thinking you jump from a higher point. Your, your step up. Yeah, yeah. I get. I get what you're saying. I think. So I think. I, I think I might have come down too hard on the micro SaaS community, um, but I think all I was saying was like, I think if you do start a micro SaaS or something like that, maybe it's your first time building, um, a SaaS product and, you know, it's going to give you a ton of experience. 
You're going to um, understand how to, you know, all the things that you would understand if you were to build a bigger company. And so I think, especially, you know, being a young person, you know, maybe you're in college or you just graduated in like your early 20s, something like that. I think that's a, an amazingly positive route to go. Um, because, you know, you don't have to go get a salary. You don't have to go work for a company. You can start your own thing, whatever. Um, but I do think eventually, um, you will probably end up maturing out of that idea. Um, just as, as you become older and so on. Um, but I do think it's like very valuable. Like you're going to learn all the same lessons. You're going to have to learn how to market your company. You're going to have to learn branding. You're going to have to learn design development product support. I mean, there's not a thing that you're not going to learn. And so I think it's great. Um, but at the same time, if I was to say, say I started a company that was making $25,000 a month and I'm so $250,000 a year or whatever. Um, and then three years later, I wanted to start a new company and raise money for that company. I don't think that an investor is going to necessarily give a shit about my 25 K a month company. Um, they're not going to say like, Oh, wow, that's so amazing. Like we're going to write a check on the spot. Um, I think they might say, okay, this entrepreneur has done an, it before they know how to build a product. I'm going to give them credit for that. And that's great, but I'm not going to write them a, a blank check, um, on, you know, just on some wireframes, like they're going to want all the same things that any entrepreneur is going to need to provide them. They're going to need a prototype. They're going to need some customers. Maybe they're need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in terms of an entrepreneur's career, I think it's a great stepping stone to learn and understand how to be an entrepreneur and build on the web. Um, but at the same time, I think you can learn all those same things and aim a little bit higher. Um, and again, I think mostly just thinking about the TAM, um, you know, just not sort of uh, pigeonholing yourself into the corner. Um, so yeah, I think it's great and I'm not opposed to it, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily going to give you a ton of leverage um, with investors. So am I getting it right that you're thinking that the risk difference between a micro SaaS not working in a high TAM company not working isn't that big because i think this is where my uh again it's not my my opinion it's it's kind of like i'm in the changing room and i'm trying on an opinion sure sure, sure. <laughs> i think my trying in the changing room opinion differs from yours and again i'm still forming it is uh, this calculation of what you're putting in and what comes out on the other side does my question make sense? I don't think. Yeah, it no, definitely. It makes sense. I, I think that's what I'm, I'm getting at. I think is just, I don't think that there's, I don't think one is easier or necessarily harder than the other. Um, taking, putting money aside. So let's just say we're bootstrapping both businesses. You know, we're building a convert kit um, that's, you know, $29 million a year right now, or we're building a micro SaaS that's in a small TAM that maxes at like 500K a year or something like that. I don't actually think that there's necessarily more or less work in either of those companies. Um, you know, I think you're going to be putting in the same number of hours. Um, you know, everything's going to be the same. Really all you're doing is, is placing maybe a slightly higher, um, wager that the Microsoft is going to work out because you might in your head think, okay, I'm really targeting this really, really, really small market. And, um, I have a really good understanding of what that those people need. So like, this is like very de-risked. Um, and I think that's true and that that could be true anyway, but I think there's also plenty of people that have tried to start a micro SaaS that have failed to reach, um, you know, a thousand dollars MR, you know? Um, so I think there's just as many stories there. And I actually know a dozen or so people <laughs> that have, you know, tried to start a micro SaaS SAS and failed. Um, you know, I know dozens more that have started a full on startup and failed too. But, um, again, I think what I'm saying is like, one is not necessarily easier or harder than the other. So I mean, why limit yourself? <laughs> that makes sense. And I, I get now where you're coming from. I have this image in my head of tweaking the knobs of risk, which automatically turns the knob of outcome and you're saying that the, the knob of time put in won't be that much different. 
unless I guess you take that route of I'm making a microsas because I can only deploy two hours a, a day. Or yeah, and I, that's actually a good point. I would say if you are, that's actually a really good point. Like if you don't have the time to work on it full time, um, you know, either because of financial reasons or whatever, um, and you can only put in, you know, five, 10 hours a week, um, it might be smart to start with something that's more constrained. And it may honestly, the reason for that might not be because it's a smaller market. It just might be that this, the feature set, um, and the marketing is just more defined. So there's less work that you need to do, um, because you, it's very clear what you need to build from the product perspective. And it's very clear who you're marketing to, because it's, you know, this 10,000, these 10,000 people. Um, so you might actually save time or you'll naturally save time because of the, some of those things are like more, um, defined for you. Whereas like, if you're building Shopify, you know, you could build any product and you, your product could be anything. Your marketing could be anything anywhere in the world, et cetera. Like there's just so many more options, yeah. uh, that if you can only spend 10 hours a week on something, um, you, you, there's no freaking way you can build Shopify. You know what I mean? I like the best. <laughs> Toby will beat your ass eventually. Yeah, that too. <laughs> right. I, I love how the, the, as the conversation progresses, we find more paths. So I feel like somebody can make a, uh, an if then out of our conversation, obviously this is our opinions, mostly yours, because I'm here to ask questions. Now, <laughs> a very important thing you pointed out which I want to bring to the surface is you said, if I would have to choose between making a convert kit, 29 million, a, what are they making? 29 a year or a month? Wait, I think they're 20 million ARR. Wait, yeah. ARR. Yeah. Uh, Wait, month. now I got to oh. check. Hold on. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Let me open bare metric as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 29 million a year. I was going to say okay. that'd be too crazy. 29 a month. Yeah. Would be, <laughs> oh, would be very good. Um, you said if I would have to choose between ConvertKit, 29 million a month, uh, a year, sorry, and a micro SaaS, you're uh, betting on ConvertKit. What about, and this is really the scenario which makes me think, and I'd love to know your opinion here, and I think this is the last scenario. We have to move on to something else as sure, well. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, what about if you would have to choose between micro SaaS plus something like uber or amazon something that can't be made uh with your own funds you can start a proof of concept but if it if the proof of concept hits you will probably need to raise money otherwise somebody else would raise and good luck with that so microsoft plus a very high moonshot that can't be made without raising money versus um convert kit directly 29 million a year bootstrap yeah so, I mean, I think, again, that comes down to your personal choice. Um, I have no um, ambition to build Uber. You know, it's just not something that interests me. Um, you know, if we reach a billion dollars, that that's great. But I'm not looking to build a hundred billion dollar company, um, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think for me personally, it's like, I like to build products in markets that I understand that I find exciting and I don't want to have to burn a hundred million dollars to get there or $500 million to get there. Um, I want to be able to understand with, with like say 500 K to $5 million, whether or not I have something, you know, um, I, I don't want to raise a billion dollars just to figure that out. So I think, again, it comes down to your personal opinion. Um, and also like, your risk tolerance. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely, you know, we've raised, um, I think it's, it's, you can Google it. I don't know if you know it's public, but we've raised like around $5 million. And, um, you know, I, I'm happy with that amount, but if that amount was 50 million or $500 million, I feel like a lot more pressure, I think. Um, <laughs> so, so again, yeah, I think you have to look at your own risk tolerance and think about you and like what, what interests you, um, when you're making those decisions. Um, that's you know. exactly I'm very happy you mentioned that the pressure that will come with 50 million or hell, even uh, 500 million, a billion, there are companies out there who raise more than a billion dollars and naturally they're aiming at something yeah. super And high. I think I would say though, um, I have, if we are ever play that game and, and you know, five years from now, I, yeah. I'm not saying I'm opposed to raising 500 billion, 500 billion, 500 million dollars when our company is 
at the point where we can absorb that and do it, but right. I would never want to raise like that much money in the first year or two, you know? Okay. Um, like the first time we raised money, we raised $550,000, um, you know? And so we were able to take that money and figure out whether or not we had something. And then we, mm-hmm. when we realized we did, we raised some more. So I am also of the, of the mindset of like raise just as much as you need. Um, plus just a little bit extra for buffer, um, and, and kind of keep, keep going from there. Um, not going crazy. It's, yeah. it's back to what we said earlier about how, uh, I guess, believability, like, do we, can we, do we know what to make, what to do with this much money and leverage as well? Like, I mean, maybe you can raise it, but if you're diluting the company to the point where you have so little of it, what was the point anymore? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Could you speak, do you, do you feel comfortable speaking or maybe you don't want to speak because it, it might be too far away from your situation or maybe it isn't and I'm, I'm mistaken about this scenario I mentioned earlier of maybe your ambition has or it's not even the ambition, maybe the idea would accommodate for, there's, there's no micro SaaS in, in uh, uh, ride sharing or I guess you we can twist our minds and say, yeah, but a sub SaaS to Uber, but th- that's not what I'm saying. Um, could you speak about the scenario, which m- might be a bit foreign to you of an idea that has a pull to needing a lot of money balanced with believability and leverage um, being the moonshot. Could you speak about that sort of scenario being the moonshot? Um, I guess I'm not exactly understanding what you mean. <laughs> I'm asking, I'm asking, um, you said you, you're not interested right now with yeah. in, in making Podia a company yeah. where you raise 50 million, 150, half right. a billion, something like that. Yeah. Is it too far away from your current situation to imagine a scenario like that and speak about the, no. how you, cause you mentioned something very important, which was, uh, there would be more tension if I would imagine today 50 million in Podia simply because this mm-hmm. is not the stage we're at. But, and, and, and this is the core of, of this whole discussion, it's sure. just that we've taken it uh, step by step. If you raise half a billion, but at the same time, you don't have that much pressure because you know you have this source of income. Let's, let's not even call it a micro SaaS. Maybe you have a, an empire of dry cleaners bringing sure. you a million a year, which you know is enough for you and your family at this lifestyle. That pressure is a bit alleviated as opposed to somebody who has raised half a billion because they look like the next uh, Mark Zuckerberg, but they're, if, if it fails, they have all their eggs in one basket. So it all goes yeah. to shit. So I, so I don't really even think about it in terms of risk to my own personal finances. I almost think about it more as like my, a risk to my reputation and like the company. Um, so, you know, just say I had a million dollars a year in other income, like imagine my wife made a million dollars a year or something like that. Um, I don't know if that actually would make me feel better um, or worse or not at all about taking $50 million. Um, because I think for me, the pressure is more like if I'm going to take that amount of money and I think we could, we could absorb that right now. And I think we could potentially put it to use, but, um, if we were to take that amount of money, I just want to be sure that I can, you know, take a dollar and and make three back, you know? So it's, and, and I think it takes a while as a company to get to a point where that's true. Um, and, and it's certainly not in the first few years you know, you're lighting all that money on fire um, <laughs> because you, you don't know how to spend it properly yet. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, f- the thing about it too is like $50 million is, is just a lot of money, you know? Um, even if you say, I'm going to put $25 million into, into marketing or ad spend, that's still $25 million where you got to like hire, you got to put to use like this. It's just going to... It, going to blow up everything in the sense that like, you know, recruiting is going to take more of your time. You're going to have to manage more people. Like it's just, it's, everything is going to go get crazy. Um, and so, yeah, as a personal, as a person, I don't want to take that next step until I'm like hundred percent, a thousand percent confident that we can do it and not, and only benefit from it. Um, and that's just kind of how I think about it. 
you know, the last 18 months, we've had a million investors try to throw a ton of money at us. Um, and I've been just told them, you know, get back to me in 2022 because we got some work we want to try to do first, you know? Mm. Um, and, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's every additional dollar you take and every additional investor is on your cap table. There is just like, there is some amount of pressure, even though, you know, we, we have a ton of investors I never talked to. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's pressure from it for sure. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine taking, you know, half a billion dollars and, and that that's just crazy. <laughs> Would you say responsibility is a better word? Cause I think yeah. you're saying pressure, but I understand at the same time, you're not <laughs> being like this in your room thinking, what am I doing with this money? You're not panicking, but yeah. I understand how with more power comes more responsibility with more money sure. comes more responsibility. Yeah, I think with more money that you don't know what to do with mm. comes more pressure and responsibility. Um, and I think the dollar amount doesn't matter so much. It's more like how many of those dollars do I not know where to put? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like, you know, if you have a really concrete plan where you can, you know exactly how you're going to spend a $50 million um, and, you know, you're confident, then that's great. Um, but if you only know how to spend 20 million out of that 50 million, um, then I think that's like risky, um, you know, or, you know, the plan is that you put 30 million in the bank and just let it sit there for, you know, five years from now when you might need it, um, which is, you know, a pretty common strategy these days. Like I see a lot of companies raising 50, $150 million, but they don't even touch it. They just have wow. it there. Isn't yeah. that, isn't there like an unwritten contract that for every penny an investor gives you, they expect three pennies, 10 in the best case scenario, something like that. No, I mean, honestly, I think the market is so hot right now that investors just want a piece of your, of the cake, you know? Mm. Um, and they just want options or stock or stock, not options, um, in, in your, in your company. And they don't care how you're going to use the money, you know, like, mm. um, you know, say you're a big company raising at a billion dollar valuation. Um, they're not concerned necessarily how much you're going to, where you're going to spend it. They're just, they just want a piece, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Kind of like a luxury buy maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, there's, there's so much money out there right now. Um, yeah. And I think like a lot of people just, they just want some action. Yeah. Cause I feel like it for, for, for some space in the market to be a luxury purchase, say bags, first of all, the market has to be mature enough. And then there has to be some oversaturation of the technical aspects of bags. There's no uh, luxury purchase in the creator economy software simply because it's too early. But perhaps maybe this is the rise that we see now with luxury quote unquote purchases on stuff like email client you see with hey.com or superhuman simply because those markets yeah. are more mature. So there, there has been enough time for people to, anyways, I'm, I'm digressing here. Uh, sure. I appreciate all the stuff you mentioned. I want to switch gears a bit so that this episode sure. is not solely because uh, solely uh, based on that. Can you give us the juicy early preview, exclusive access to <laughs> what's happening to, to Podia in this new update that's coming? Sure. When would that be? 20? 7th, 20, the, the 28th. So, 28th. um, only a few days away. Um, yeah, I mean, so just for some background, um, you know, we're, we're a digital store platform, um, you know, tens of, tens of thousands of, of paying customers. Um, everyone gets their own store where they can fully customize it and sell all different types of digital products. So courses, downloads, webinars, coaching, um, and then we have built in marketing tools. Like we have built in email marketing. We have built in affiliate marketing. We've got built in live chat for you and your customers. Um, so we've got a ton of different features. Um, we also launched memberships, which is a way to earn recurring revenue, um, back in December, 2017. Um, and so what I hinted at earlier was like, at the time we were a team of five, uh, myself, um, three developers and a designer. And so when we launched that feature, we actually had plans and we had designs and we had mock-ups to build it more of like a community and more of a community style where your members could, you know, not only get access to your products. So it works sort of like Netflix and that you can add to different digital products. And then that subscriber or that member gets access to that library. 
Um, so when we originally started working on it, we decided we thought, hey, it would be great if these members could communicate together. You know, you, as a creator, you could create topics and you know, it would act more like a forum, sort of like more like a private Reddit style um, thing. Anyway, we, we, we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, we ran out of resources and we sort of put that on the shelf. Um, and then, so over the last four years, um, we've been continuing to get a lot of requests from our customers. Like, Hey, I would love to have a community, uh, where people that purchase my content and consume my content could, um, spend time and communicate with each other and, you know, build relationships and so on and so on. And I really don't want to do it on Facebook groups. You know, I, I don't want to have my community there and I don't want to have it in another I don't want to go sign up for another product that's standalone, that's community software, because, you know, now my customers have to, you know, have login over here and login over there. And it's just like a nightmare. Um, so then early on in the, in, in COVID, um, we began working on community, um, and then COVID hit and we shifted gears and we started building out some products for people that we realized would be affected by the pandemics. We built like webinars as a product offering and a bunch of other features. And then finally, um, earlier this year, so early 2021, we decided the time was right to revisit our plans for community. And we began with just myself, a designer and a developer building out the product. Um, and then by the end of the first quarter, we began to staff up the product project more um, whereas today now we have four developers, uh, full time on, on, um, the community feature and it launches next week. So basically what we've done is that we've converted the membership feature into a community feature. And so all of our creators now have their own private, um, their own private community directly built on their store. And so when people sign up for the community or they sign up for their products, they have access and the creators can create different topics around, you know, whatever makes sense for them. Um, you know, there's a lot of access control. So, you know, part of the community can have access to this topic, whereas other parts of the community can have access to this topic and you can create public um, topics as well. And it allows members to um, to participate, ask questions, you know, post in different topics. And, um, we're really, really excited about it. And so far people are really pumped. <laughs> so you've previewed it to some of your users, you said, and those yeah, we are getting, we did. Pumped. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, we sent to our, um, massive email list, a teaser a couple of days ago, um, and got a lot of really, really positive, um, responses. And then we've done a couple of webinar previews, um, over the last few days, and I'm going to do one next week as well. Um, and yeah, people are super excited. Uh, we, we, we ran a lot of surveys, um, and we found that nine out of 10 people, um, would are excited to leave their current, uh, community platform, um, and how much everyone hates Facebook groups. Uh, so I think we have an exciting future ahead of ourselves. <laughs> that, that must feel good. Doesn't it to have, to it, know it that does from a behemoth, which I think they even said publicly that they're going strong on Facebook groups on 20, what, 17, 18. I, I can't remember when, but they said it and you can see it it's down there in the tab bar on the mobile app, multiple things. I bet it feels good to, to know that people are flocking from this giant, yeah. which shift the gears into groups towards you. Yeah. I mean, I think the, one of the cool things about the creator economy is that it's, it's woken up a lot of people about the idea that they need to own their email lists. They need to own their customers. They need to own their platform. Um, and I think Facebook is obviously the worst example of all of those things. Um, you know, with one news feed tweak, uh, people might never get your Facebook group updates. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, monetization on Facebook is tough. Um, we make it really, really simple. Um, you know, and I think another thing for us, for our customers and part of our philosophy is just having everything in one place. Um, so for our customers, you know, this is already where their customers are purchasing their products or signing up for their courses, buying their downloads. And so it just naturally makes sense to have their community, um, alongside all of that information. Um, and so there's a lot of cool things we can do, um, around like, you know, you and I both own the same course. So like, here's a topic around that course and we can communicate in that and so on. Um, but yeah, I really, it really feels good because I've been anti-Facebook also for about five years. 
Um, I deleted my account about five years ago and I'm happy to finally be able to go up against this behemoth, even though we're like the size of an ant uh, compared to them. Uh, but it, it is you know, great to do my part, I guess. Well, you to have take a, them down. <laughs> you, as a small ant, you have a small army gathering behind you more and more. Exactly. Every day, I guess. Exactly. So there's your battalion. Well, how does it? What's it like to 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 be early in a wave? So <laughs> to use the surfing analogy, to mm -hmm. be at two a.m. on the beach. Because yeah. I want I want to point out. I think you were earlier than. It might be healthy if you're looking to make the most money ASAP to the point where kind of like that graph of early adopters, you've got the innovators, early adopters, and that's uh, where it's on the rise. Mm -hmm. If you want to make the most money ASAP, you might want to be uh, after the half of early adopters, just trying to put it down. But yeah. I think you've been at innovators, so you had to weather the storm a bit. We did, which, yeah. Which also turned out to be very good timing for you because you said... Uh, it was only you in the beginning, then a contractor, then five. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how's that feeling like? I mean, it's great. I think, you know, part of it, I think we got a, like a little lucky um, just with the timing, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, but at the same time, as I, I was seeing this really early on, um, even as early as 2011, so 10 years ago, um, you know, my experience running Carbon Made, um, which was the first digital um, online portfolio company for creators. Um, I got to see the, the, the market very, very early. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's crazy to be in such an innovative company at the start of the wave, so to speak, you know, first one at the beach. Um, but yeah, it was very tough from 2000, late 2014 through um, honestly, like early 2018 for the first three, four years of the company it was really, really tough. Um, you know, we we're scraping by um, trying to figure out what kind of product we're going to build, what kind of customers would use it and so on. But now we've cemented ourselves, at least in our market, um, where I think we're the most innovative company out there, uh, building the best products. And we've got like the, the ocean in front of us, so to speak, <laughs> like we can do anything. Um, and so it's really, really exciting, uh, to be there, but, um, it's also very nerve wracking, like going back to the bootstrap versus fundraising topic for just 10 seconds. Like I could never have built this company bootstrapping. We just would never have made enough revenue in those three first three or four years to weather the, the storm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm super happy to be where we are today. I think it's, it's much more tough if you were to start today to build a creator economy company, um, and try to compete in the market with like us or other companies. We're just, there's too much product to build. Um, and, and not enough time. So uh, all that is to say, yeah, being early is awesome. <laughs> well, because you, I mean, let's, there's no better, there's no nicer way to put it. The, the reason why we're speaking and we having the AMA and that, I mean, it's a tough word out there, but the reason why we're doing that is because you are early and right. If you wouldn't be right, perhaps yeah. you wouldn't get that many DM requests or stuff yeah. like that. But everybody understands that, I guess, uh, you more so. Yeah. Uh, and congrats to you for taking the risk, weathering the storm, all that stuff, paying out. I've got a bit of a less pleasant question now in the same analogy. What's sure, it like sure. to, for it to be 8 or 9 a.m. now and you see all these new surfers coming in saying, all right, guys, <laughs> this is the wave. Let's go. Creative economy. Yeah. Woo! Let's get it. And I think yeah, sure. you have all these, I mean, competitors or micro competitors. So I, I, um, I feel very strongly about our position in the market for what we do. So I'm not worried about competitors just because I know for competitors to us, because I just know how much software you have to build. Um, you know, we've been building this thing since 2014. Um, you know, that's almost eight years of product and, you know, thousands of lines of code, insane amounts of design work, like to, to get to where we are, any company that's starting today would take four years. And then four years, we're going to be that much further. So I don't really get concerned about companies that um, are competing with us directly. I think I, where I am not really concerned, but where I probably should be more concerned is just making sure that I follow the creator market very closely to understand where the market is heading. And um, I think that's one of my like 
talents, I guess. And for example, one of the reasons why we're, we're finally launching our community feature is because community is such a hot topic for individual creators. Um, cause they all understand that once they get to a certain size, they need their community to support them and to build along with them. Um, so again, I think we're going to be early in that space too. Um, but you know, maybe if we didn't launch this community feature, there's a chance that another company could come out there, build something and, and beat us, you know? Um, but I'm not really concerned about, you know, the general creator economy and people, you know, beating us to what, like what, what we do, we're the best at, and I think we'll continue to be, um, so, <laughs> which is a very perfect perfect it got something can't be very perfect which is a perfect segue into my next question you've hinted at this in the ama as well mm -hmm. you said something along the lines of correct me if i'm wrong uh something along the lines of we've chosen to do multiple products and maybe they weren't perfect but we've put them out because i spencer believe it's it's easier to um to improve upon something than to get it perfect in the, in, from the first try. Did I summarize that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything we build, like for example, this community feature we're going to launch, it's, it's not perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to be the very best community platform on the internet um, from day one. But I think the good thing is that it's going to do most of the things that people want. And it's also going to, because it's combined with the, the digital store side of things, it's actually going to be a leg up on all those other community platforms, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer of, of um, I think you're getting at the idea of like iteration and, um, you know, product development for me, it's what drives me is releasing something. I don't care until the day of the release. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, I, and we're constantly like, I, this is something that's really important at our company and part of our philosophy is just like release, iterate, release, iterate, release, iterate. And I know like everyone says like, that's so important. And, you know, but a lot of companies say it, but they don't practice it. You know, we're, we're pushing the production daily. We are, you know, constantly updating, improving our product. Um, and something that I really th value is like, you need something to be out in the market being used by customers um, to understand anything about how it's going to work. And so I think you could design, you know, the most perfect solution and then it goes in the market and maybe you've over-designed it so much that you're actually going to lose the feedback. Um, that being said, one of the things that we do do is that my designer and I tend to design the ideal experience from the start and then we throw out 80% of it. <laughs> you know? oh, wow. so, yeah, because I think like it's really, it. sure. Yeah. So I think it's really helpful to understand where you can go with the feature, mm -hmm. um, and to understand like how it might in its ideal form, your, you know, the ideal form in your head, um, what it's going to look like. Um, uh, and then you can just pair back. Um, and so what we typically do, even for community, for example, um, two thirds of what we are, or sorry, a third of what we designed is going to get released on the 28th two thirds of what we have designed is not released yet, but we've already started building that stuff out as projects and base camp. And, um, you know, we're going to be getting to build out each one of those over time. Um, I think we have like eight or nine different little projects as follow on additions, but at the same time, like I want to get the feature out and I don't want to wait another six months. Um, I don't want to wait another year. Um, and I want to get in the hands of our customers and I want to get feedback. Um, and I think one of the other things that's really important is that you may think you know the right order of operations to build out that feature, um, but actually what your, your customers are going to tell you, because <laughs> you know we're going to release that feature next Tuesday and people are going to say, I really need this, need this, you know, and that might even be in our plans, but we were planning on doing it like three or four iterations later, but now we're going to bring it back and, and do it next. Um, so yeah, so I'm a huge uh, fan of, of iteration um, and, you know, getting customer feedback. I was doing a small uh, victory fest because you said you're using Basecamp and everybody I talk yeah. to, these, we're using Basecamp as well. Everybody I talk to these days is using whatever, all these other ones. Asana so, or Linear or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so it's nice to finally connect with somebody who's still on Basecamp. Yeah, not I mean, that, it's... Not that I'm sad for them. I know they're doing okay, but 
yeah just yeah to- i mean just just to say like a comment about our tool set so one of the things that we really care about as a company is is using the proven tools um that we understand we understand them we aren't going to have any surprises um you know etc so like there may very well be a better base camp out there um but this works great for us and we're familiar with it and it, they're going to be around here next year they're going to be around the year after that um so you know it's not it's something i don't need to worry about whereas like you can often sign up for software where you're just like i don't know if this company's going to be here in 2 years and I don't know what they're going to do with this product. And so I, I usually tend to prefer things that are like, um, have been in the market for a while. Do you do that as well with stuff like maybe the tech stack or maybe even your yeah. personal life? Like, um, I don't know, a phone, I guess, or hardware, even though with hardware, it's quite hard because there are monopolies out there, I guess. Do you usually tend to go to what you said they established and maybe because that that sounds good in theory but to anybody who's ever done it in practice it means saying no to the latest and shiniest piece yeah. of we, we constantly say say no to the latest and shiniest um yeah. i mean even with our tech stack like we're built on ruby and rails um you know we use heroku and amazon web services um you know we're, we're not looking to um make sure we're using the latest craziest technology um, I think that's also really important too, for recruiting, um, that you, you don't necessarily, I mean, so there's two schools of thought there. Like if you use the latest and greatest, you're going to attract the developer that may not even care about the startup. They just care about that, that you're using that latest tech mm-hmm. framework. Um, whereas if you use something like tried and true, like Ruby and rails, there's a much larger, um, cool. group of candidates, um, that have maybe been working on Ruby on rails for 10 years or 15 years. And so they have a ton of experience. So yeah, I, I I tend to, you know, there's enough risks with the product and the company already that like tech stack software, et cetera. Like I try to use the, the, the proven companies, you know, has this decision ever done wrong to you? I'm I'm not finding it properly, but has this ever cost you in a way you reckon? Nope. (laughs) No moment no. where you said, ah, oh, if only this time we used the latest and the no. shiniest. No, honestly, if anything, it's been the opposite where we have on occasion tried something that was like the fancy <laughs> latest version of this and we've had to walk it back. So for example, um, I don't want to throw them under the bus because, but they're a pretty big company. We were using Lattice um, for our performance reviews and one-on-ones and stuff like that. And the software was just so overly complicated and there were so many features and um it was just crazy and you know enterprise pricing i think we were spending i don't know sixteen thousand a year on or something like that eighteen thousand a year and then we switched to know your team um, which is a former base camp company product and i think yeah. we pay i don't know a few hundred bucks a month or something for it and it's simple it doesn't have all the bells and whistles it doesn't have like all the calendar integrations whatever or maybe even does but it's just I like simple products um, that are, you know, that are maybe not the flashiest. <laughs> it doesn't have an iPhone app, for example. But do you really need it? You I, don't. I that, that's my point. Yeah, yeah you yeah. don't need it. You know, it's uh, you just want it to do its thing. Um, yeah. Would you recommend it to others, this sort of philosophy, or is it uh, tailored, so to speak? to your persona as well, uh, going for the mm-hmm. simpler. Because, you know, some people are like that. They they want the latest and greatest because they want to have control over everything or they want to know, maybe they won't use it, but they want to know they have all these features. Would you recommend to people on a practical level or is it more tailored to your persona? Um, I think a little bit of both. I think, you know, partly there's some people that, you know, just are constantly on product hunt, trying every new product and, you know, that's, that's them. I think that was more me 15 years ago. Um, but these days, like, I just want the simple thing that works. Um, and, but I, but I also think it's like, it's important to not constantly be, you know, trying everything new at all the time, at all the time, because who's got time for that, you know, (laughs) back to your discussion about, which I think was, had some very lovely points in there about, making multiple products and iteration um 
obviously the numbers I'm going to put out are a bit of a, a mental exercise, but between uh, f- five out of 10 products uh, released, five out of 10 releases nine times a year versus nine out of 10 products three times a year, it strikes me that you would go for five out of 10 multiple times a year. Am I getting you right? Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, I, I, I guess I don't really understand the five out of 10 versus nine. Out of 10. <laughs> five out of 10 in terms of performance, quality, oh, complexity. I see, I see, I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think go on. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, I would know. I would just say, I'm not, I'm not shooting for five out of 10. Cause I think that is a little low. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you know, I I'd be happy with something like a, you know, a 78%. Uh, out of a hundred or something like that, something that where you're like, okay, I get it. Um, you know, I'm a customer. This is good. I'm going to use this thing. Um, maybe it doesn't have everything I need, but, um, I understand that it has the potential there. So, you know, I I think I'm always constantly shooting for something between like a 78 and like an 85%. Um, I'm never, you know, with every release, I, what I'm, what I'm hoping is that the overall experience of the entire product is a 10 out of 10, right? Um, but every feature within the product doesn't have to be a 10 out of 10. It can be, you know, a seven out of 10 or eight out of 10. Um, but added together collectively, you get this, um, 10 out of 10 experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's something that we've, our customers really appreciate too, because we're constantly, constantly updating the product. And so every time they, they log in, there's something new, um, something better, something improved. And so they, they're constantly feeling that energy from us. Um, but yeah, uh, quick side question. What's a time hard limit you have w- with this interview so I can know how to batch out the rest of the things. Um, probably like 20 more, 20 minutes. Cool. What would you say <laughs> Spencer in your, uh, years of, of experience, what mm-hmm. makes the difference between a, uh, an average founder and the ones who are way above average, like the Mm-hmm. maybe not outliers but let's just call it top 10 percent. i guess that's outliers i don't know it depends yeah <laughs> numbers what makes the difference between an average founder and a extraordinary founder or yeah. maybe maybe even business person because you see a lot of creators and whether they know it or not they are business people at a certain point yeah so um i think it's always re- uh important to remember that you know seven out of ten businesses fail um so i mean if you're thinking about like the what is the difference between the entrepreneur that makes it versus the entrepreneur that doesn't make it? Um, there's a couple of different things that I think I see one. Um, I, I always say this, but persistence is so important. Um, you need to con- constantly uh, push forward and make improvements for in everything you do as an entrepreneur. And the ones that I see that sort of um, maybe don't hit that, you know, one of those seven out of 10 that fail, they don't have that often where they get frustrated and, and, you know, it's frustrating. Like I've had times, um, you know, in the early days of this company where I was like, I'm going to give up. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to, right. Cause I'm just going to keep pushing forward. I'm pe- I want those little wins, keeping those little wins. So I think one thing I see entrepreneurs that fail to do is just keep pushing forward and you have to keep pushing forward. Um, and as soon as you stop pushing forward, you're going to fail. I think the other thing I see with entrepreneurs that don't do well is that they are building products in terrible markets. Um, You know, and again, like I come back to markets are so important. You can have the best product from like a design perspective, features, sorry, um, feature set, et cetera. Um, But if you, if you don't build in the right product or sorry, if you don't build in the right market, like you're going to fail. It's so important. Um, you know, the other thing too, is like, you need to be good at recruiting people to work with you. Um, you need to be, you need to be excellent at that actually, because the difference between like, I have some a plus 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 people on my team, but the difference between like some a plus plus person, um, and someone who's like a B level is, is seriously the difference between being successful and not like the people that you work with just matter incredibly high amount. It's just like, There's maybe, that might even be the most important thing, honestly, is to have excellent people working with you. Um, And then I think another thing would just be um, being very intelligent around um, 
the story and the marketing and the brand that you're building and that you're putting out there into the world. Um, I think some of the people that tend to fail, is, everything comes off as too generic and there's no personality, there's no soul. And so you don't, I'm not interested in your product, right? Like if you're just selling me some generic thing, you know, whatever, like your marketing copy sucks, your design is terrible. It doesn't seem like you care. Um, I'm going to lose interest and I'm going to, you know, close my web browser. Um, so yeah, so those are just a few things I could probably say a dozen more if you want me to. <laughs> if, if there wouldn't be a time limit, I would, but I, I think what you've given so far is strong because I want to go a bit deeper on the persistence bit. I'm curious to know what, what, what drove you more so in the early days and what keeps on driving you now. I don't think I'll be mistaken if I would say that if you put your mind to it, you could sell Podia uh, in the next months or maybe weeks. I don't know. And you'd be living comfortably financially, <laughs> but um, clearly you're not doing that. You're doing quite the opposite, going stronger. What, what, what makes you tick? What, what's the, what's the spark? What's the flywheel in your head that makes you get out of bed and not <laughs> stick for two more hours every day and be lazy? Yeah. I mean, I, I get an endorphin rush when, um, you know, our revenue goes up and our customers are successful and our employees are happy. Um, you know, we've actually had a bunch of employees in the past year buy houses, um, for the first time. And like, that's like amazing. Um, so I, I, I really like what gets me up every day is just like making progress. Um, and, uh, you know, like every code we commit, every support request we respond to, every, you know, marketing email we send, like to me, that just like, it all, it all feels good. Um, and so, yeah, I just, <laughs> for me, for me, like I'm, I'm going on, this is the longest company I've ever owned. Uh, all my previous companies, I sold at around the four year mark. Um, but I think what gets me going about this company is it's just really fun. Uh, you know, we're building this great product in this um, huge market and I've got like an amazing team around me. Um, but to your question earlier about like perseverance and, and why it's important to me, I think the reason is because every company I've started, um, and this is, I've sold four companies. So I'm, I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, every single one, there was a moment in the first you know, year where I thought about giving up and I thought about why, you know, why are we not making progress? Why don't we have customers, et cetera. And I just always stuck through it, you know, for another three, six months or more. And by the time that, you know, that, that time had passed, we were, we had something, right. And I think there's just so many entrepreneurs that I know that they get to that dark, area where, you know, they're not getting sales, blah, 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 whatever. And then just like, all right, well, maybe it's just the product. No one cares. And they just give up. Um, and they might not even like necessarily hundred percent give up in terms of like shutting it down, but they just give up mentally and they say, oh yeah, no, maybe I can't do this. Maybe it's, maybe it's not going to work out. I'll keep going with it, but you know, I'm not going to put the same amount of effort. And so my life experience has taught me that if you just keep going, um, you know, don't be a fool, <laughs> you know, don't keep going on something that has zero prospects, but, um, keep going beyond sort of the normal limit you might set yourself for. Is there a bit of a personal question, but is there some spirituality as well in doing what you said earlier, making progress and when you said make you okay, you said a revenue increase, but that wasn't the only thing you said. You don't strike me as a person who is motivated by getting the next big pay payday or stuff. You, you mentioned, which I think was really lovely, employees buying houses. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that some of the creators uh, using Podia managed to oh, yeah. make I mean, some nice purchases. I don't know. Multi-millionaires <laughs> on the platform, for sure. There we go. Um, is that somehow, uh, what I was trying to say is if I were to put words in your mouth for the 11th time on this sure. podcast, uh, what, what drives you is making flywheels, making positive loops, because this is a positive loop. Yeah. We make the world a better place. We make yeah. it better for some people. Is there some spirituality in that as well, in the sense of uh, it's, 
it's mm -hmm. cathartic in a sense to get close up yeah i mean i don't know i wouldn't say spirituality necessarily but um i don't mind that you say that maybe there's a little bit of that behind the scenes but um i'm not like a religious person or anything but um for me i just i don't know i i like you know the reason i start companies is because i like to s build a, a product that people are going to find value out of and so i think you know that's sort of my where i start so that's like the kernel where it's like if i build this thing and one person i can make one person happy that's amazing um you know if, hopefully i can make thousands or tens of thousands or millions or whatever um, but that's kind of where it starts and then when you get to a scale like ours where we have tens of thousands of paying customers it's um okay now it's different it's not like can i just touch one person's day it's like can i actually completely change this person's life you know mm -hmm. um and that's really cool um you know, people have earned hundreds of millions of dollars on our platform. And so when I think about that, it's like, you know, what if we didn't exist? Would they, maybe they would have used a different platform or maybe they never would have gotten started in the first place and they've never would have built a life out of them for themselves. Um, and so like, yeah, it's nice to have this sort of impact on the world. And the reason why I like progress is so important to me is because I want to have more and more impact <laughs> on the world, um, you know, as, as, as uh, the company and the product ages. That sounds, once again, like a positive loop. And, and, I, and I'm glad yeah. to hear it. Um, I just realized now that uh, maybe we should have had a bit more SaaS conversation. It's just like a bit technical. I'll just ask this to get it off the list so that people who are here for that <laughs> will not leave empty-handed. What's been some, some of your 80-20s uh, in terms of growth for Podia, some decisions, some moves, some stuff you would recommend to other people. Uh, mm -hmm. What would be your shared knowledge there? You mean like what's driven our growth? Yes, but uh, also packaged in some sort of advice. So sure. uh, uh, an example, to uh, I haven't phrased this question very well, but an example would be not saying for us work, uh, SEO work for us, but rather if you're this sort of company, as your work for us because right yeah i mean so um you know i'll quickly touch on like our marketing channels and then i can add some advice there so um predominantly our marketing channels are content and seo um social because we have our own youtube channel and we we do that full time um affiliate marketing um word of mouth um paid marketing so we we, we cover the gambit in terms of different marketing channels you can do. So what, what, part of my advice though is, is um, to founders when they're thinking about marketing on the early days is, you know, you can hear both sides. You can hear, you know, um, throw a wide net and see what lands or focus on a specific channel and, and do that, do that well. So what I typically tell people is like, start with something that's going to be, um, that you can plant the seeds. That's going to be a long-term channel for you. So for example, um, SEO and content takes a long time. So I really recommend starting that from day one. Um, cause if you don't, and then, you know, two years into it, you realize you got to do it, then you kind of, it's going to take you another two years or whatever. So typically I tell people to start content and SEO from day one. Um, but if you're going to start content from day one, you got to be good with it. Uh, you don't want to just, you know, throw up random blog posts and be like, cool. <laughs> you know, like that's not, that's not building content, Building content is much more data driven. Um, you know, you have to write better pieces, whatever. Um, I tell people don't touch paid marketing for a while. Um, you know, you really need a solid product with a excellent, uh, conversion funnel, um, great marketing, great messaging before you start doing paid marketing. Um, I, I do recommend affiliate marketing pretty early in the product because, um, if you can incentivize your customers to, you know, uh, tell their friends and get a little, uh, piece of action, that's smart. And it's really simple to iterate or sorry, really simple, simple to implement. Um, so do that. Um, social media is not something that we do a ton with other than YouTube. Um, but you don't want to look dead on any, on any channels. Uh, so at least have something on, you know, like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, you know, whatever, wherever your market is, um, have something. Um, and then if you can do video content, it's actually really complicated and it's expensive. Um, but 
get started on YouTube as soon as quick, as soon as you can too, because again, just like SEO and content, um, YouTube is, YouTube's the second biggest search engine after Google. And, um, you can actually drive a lot of leads, um, to your business that way. Um, but typically I tell people also to have a mix of short-term and long-term marketing strategy. Um, if you're only short-term focused, you're just going to be constantly fighting that forever. Um, and if you're too long-term focused, you're not going to have enough revenue early. Um, so really find that balance. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was super powerful. I appreciate, by the way, the stamina uh, of keeping up with this change of gears. Um, I brought this up now at the end. Sure, I brought it uh, earlier. <laughs> no but problem. I'm highly appreciative of you uh, keeping up the the change because it, it's easier for me to ask questions than it is for you to answer them. And I can see you putting your I, th- I think about this stuff all the time. So it's like second nature to me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording soon, but I don't want to close this before asking you if people were really touched, and I hope they were, by what you said and they found it useful, what would be your main channel to um, to reach you or to follow you with to keep up with what you're doing? Sure. So um, Twitter is the only social media platform that I use. Um, Twitter.com slash Spencer Fry, F-R-Y. Um, feel free to at message me, DM me, et cetera. Um, actually it was, it was fun after the AMA I did on Reddit with you, got a bunch of people DMing me and and stuff. So, um, always happy to help. If I don't respond to a DM immediately, it doesn't mean that I don't hate you. Uh, it's just that I have my DMS, uh, muted. (laughs) So (laughs) I only check them like a couple times a week. Um, but yeah, definitely hit me up on Twitter and, um, check out our product, uh, podia.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, well. That was it. Spencer Fry, thanks so much for taking the time today. For sure. Thank I you so much for having me. <laughs> it, was, it was lovely. And I appreciate all the effort you put into all, all these answers. No uh, worries. To anybody listening to this, enjoy the rest of your day and make sure you follow Spencer. Thank you.